Mr. Stager, whenever you're ready, we do have a quorum present, so we're ready to, to go. Let me see. Move to the next page. Do we have the... Do we, can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Guetta? Um, Francis C. Pancho Averill Jr. Here. Richard Norton. Here. Jose C. Gonzalez. Javier Martinez. I, I didn't hear him. I, and I thought he was here. Mr. Martinez, you're muted. He is here. You can he continue. is here. Uh, Louis P. Labode. Here. Joey Tellez. Present. Uh, Javier Compian. Here. David Montes. Here. And Osvaldo E. Lara. And he mentioned he wasn't going to be able to attend. For the record, we do have quorum. Thank you. Um, Kirby, I'm going to go ahead and turn over number three to you so you can introduce the new members. Okay, great. Uh, we do have a couple of new members with us, Mr. Montes and, and Mr. Tejas. If you could introduce yourselves in that order, Mr. Montes, please. <laughs> Mr. Montes, you're muted if you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. You're still you're still muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi, I'm David Montes. I was uh, an educator for many years, retired. The obvious thing about me when, when you meet me is that I'm in a wheelchair. I'm a disabled man. I was injured playing high school football. Um, then uh, I ran for city council for District 7, successful. And Vanessa Perez uh, appointed me to this board. Served before under Charlie San Miguel in the paratransit committee. And I'm ready to contribute in any way I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Montes. And Mr. Tejas, would you like to introduce yourself to the board? Mr. Tejas, you're muted. Mr. Tejas, you're still muted. There you go. All right. My name is Joey Tejas. I'm an attorney here in Laredo, and thank you for for letting me on. You're welcome, man. Mr. Tejas uh, has a lot of good experience. Yes, Judge. Actually, I'm sorry, Judge. Yes. Um, as far as the motion to read, he's got a lot of good experience. He's bringing from the Planning Commission, and uh, we're we're excited to have him on the the Board of Adjustment. So those are our two new members we have. And the next item on the agenda is the election of officers. All right. We just have one. You are the, the chair. You were elected towards the end of last year. And uh, the vice chair, that person was, that position was appointed. Uh, we lost that, that person and a new person was appointed in their stead. So we need to elect a new vice chair. So if you would like to administer that, that uh, election of a vice chair, Mr. Averill? I'll uh, make a motion to elect uh, uh, Louis Levote as the vice chair. And I would, I'd suggest that you ask if there are any other, that you hear any other candidates that anyone would like to put forward, and then you can vote on those that were put forward. As a suggestion. So what again? I'm sorry. I I would suggest that you ask the board if there is anyone else they'd like to put forward. As yeah. The, in other words, is, is there any other um, any other nominations to the floor? No other nominations. 
So uh, having said that, can we uh, move to elect the Vice Chair Louis Lavaud by acclamation? I, guess, I think we need a vote. Need a second of that motion? I second it. I have a motion and a second to uh, elect by acclamation the Vice Chair Louis Lavaud. All those in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, who is that second, just for the record? Rick Norton. All right, thank you, Mr. Norton. Okay, can we, can I get the agenda back up, approval of the minutes? When was the last meeting, Kirby? Last meeting was in November, and it was in the packet. Yeah, I didn't, didn't remember. Um, okay, I'm sure everybody had a chance to go over it, because that was, that was a fairly detailed meeting, if I remember correctly. But uh, do I have a, a motion to ex uh, approve the minutes of the November meeting? I move I'll, that we approve the minutes. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Did you get that, Kirby? Yes, sir. A motion and a second to approve the minutes of the November meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Kirby, did you get who who made the motions and who second? I Richard did not. Norton seconded. Who moved? Who was the motion? I think I moved and, and Rick seconded. Okay. All right. Um, refresh my memory on this one. Item agenda six. Kirby. Yes, sir. We, as part of the Texas Open Meetings Act, every public meeting we have, we're required to have a citizens comment section where the public can comment on any topic they would like. And so complying with state law, we are putting up a phone number where the public can call in. Now, this is being broadcast on Spectrum Channel 1300 and on the city's website. However, there is a, about a 30 second lag. So we wanna hold here and pause for just a little bit if we do get any calls, either immediately or during the meeting, we'll alert you so that we can bring those. Do we have anybody to speak? We don't. We don't. But we do need to give it just a minute because of the because of the lag. And while we're doing that, I'll just add that if you are not muted, if you can mute yourself, it really helps with the feedback and it preserves the audio quality. If you forget and it's left open, I'll I'll try to um, police that a little bit and mute you. I don't mean to be rude at all. I'm just trying to keep the best audio quality. Sometimes you can't hear it on your end, but you're, you create an echo for the rest of us. And um, so before you speak, just check to see if you're muted or unmuted, because I might have I might have secretly muted you. But uh, no, nothing meant by that. You're all free. Can I ask a question, Kirby? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, why would anybody call if we don't have anything on the agenda? Who's well, sometimes the public uh, just wants to speak at some venue and um, you know, they may or may not call, but we're required by law to give them the opportunity to call in. So that's why we're just, doing it. Just, just, just outright speak on anything that's not covered by the Board of Adjustments? Yes, they could just, I mean, you would you would assume that they would speak at something relevant to the Board of Adjustment, but they don't have to. They, they just have the opportunity to speak as a right uh, for the Texas Open Meetings Act. So. Can I ask one more question, Kirby? Sure. Um, Besides the opportunity to speak, I mean, because of COVID and everything, are we going to have the opportunity to have people by a uh, Zoom meeting at hearings and stuff like that at the uh, city chambers? Are they going to be able to appear online in some manner? I was going to speak to that uh, in the director's comments portion, and but I guess I could, I could answer that question now. We are waiting from council before we get direction on when we can meet again in public. Now, they may give us the option, because some committees don't have a public portion. You know, it's just it's just a committee that doesn't have to meet publicly. In those cases, it's a lot easier for them to conduct their meeting in person. For us, because we were using the council chambers, if you've seen how the council chambers are set up, it's not set up for in-person meetings. And unless we're inviting the public in to actually come in physically and speak, it takes many more staff to coordinate that room the way you know, if we if we meet partly in public and partly in in person, 
it, the logistics of it are very complicated. It takes a lot of staff. So what I would recommend we do as a board, we continue to meet virtually until we can meet 100% and, and invite the public in as well. At that point, we will meet uh, public again. And I'll be coordinating that with the chairman, uh, Averill, um, and he'll make that call. Is, it, is there any idea when that would be? It could. It, what, things are trending really well. Our hospitalization rate is down at uh, below 2%, and, you know, where things are looking really good. It could be very soon. Uh, we'll, we'll know more on Monday when we have our most recent council meeting. Um, but maybe the city council decides to play it a little safe and doesn't want the public to be participating in public meetings um, in person for a while. So I can't say, but I would guess it'd be soon. That's what I would guess. So is there any anybody on the call that dialed in for citizens' comments? No, sir, there's not. Okay. So we'll move we'll move forward training by staff. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, this is our annual training. At minimum, we will always give you a training at least once a year. Now we also give a training, this training, very similar to this, to all new board members. So um, board member Tellez and Montez are gonna have all the answers because they just got this, um, which they're gonna sound smarter than the rest of y'all. But at minimum, we're gonna come back with this same material. Now, some of y'all that are really good remembering things are gonna be like, hey, Kirby, come on. I just, you know, you just gave this to us last year. And some of y'all are gonna be like, oh, did you give this to us last year? I don't remember any of this. <laughs> so we'll give this to you again and again because, look, y'all are busy. Y'all are working. You have your lives. You do this as on a volunteer basis. And we want to continue to remind you to keep you fresh on this material. So if you already know it, great. But it, it's good for you and the public to be continually reminded of this. So at minimum, one training a year. But as we need, as you ask, we can give additional trainings on certain subjects, we can dive a little more deeply. So it's, that's something we're trying to do very uh, a lot more of in the planning department for all the boards and commissions we oversee, a lot more training to facilitate you as a board member to make the best decisions possible. So today what we're gonna go over is rules governing the board. We're gonna talk about the conduct of board meetings. We're gonna review some ethical, important ethical guidelines. We're gonna talk about the ordinance update that we took to council that changed the rules of membership for the Board of Adjustment is very important. That'll be new for everybody. Well, you may remember we talked about it, but the, but we haven't reviewed it with everyone yet. So that will definitely be new. And then an opportunity for discussion at the end. I anticipate that we'll get through this in about 20 minutes. If And then if there's any questions or comments, we'll take some more. So we'll be, this won't be a long meeting today. Okay, so why and how do we regulate development? You know, the why has to do with, we have an overall plan for the city that is required by the state of Texas, but it's also a good practice to have a plan for our for the way the city develops. And many of you have seen this in some of the issues that come up with Board of Adjustment. Sometimes you're dealing with conflicting land uses next to each other. And many of y'all have scratched your heads and asked me and said, Kirby, how did, how did the city let this happen? You know, how did this end up like this? And a lot of the answers can sometimes be poor planning. And, you know, we all get so busy with everything we're doing in different parts of the city. We need to have an overarching plan that gives us direction. And when we do that, we reduce land conflicts. We assure that there's adequate facilities, water, sewer, and other utilities, stormwater, so that we don't deal with, with issues uh, when they come you know, emergency issues, and also just to generate, promote a better quality of life. How do we do it? We do it through zoning. We've, we've got the, the land development code, which gives us the ability to zone to say what uses can be where. We have ordinances that are local law that tell us that the city council votes in to say how things can operate in the city. And then something that's not used as frequently, but, all, but is used, we can make private agreements between the city and a developer to go above and beyond what the requirements are. And sometimes that's a, that's a give and take. So the city has something to offer 
and we want something in return and the result may be we get um, you know something we we can't actually require but we can enter into an agreement with a developer to make something happen in terms of new development Now, just for your reference, where can you find all this? The Texas Local Government Code, which is the LGC, abbreviated as LGC, that is the, the state law where it contains a lot of the requirements dealing with zoning, dealing with subdivision, the authority for us to subdivide property into lots and, and uh, ownership, the requirement for comprehensive planning, and also contained in i believe chapter 211 is the rules governing the board of adjustment so as you recall the rule in the larger training that we we gave you previously there are actually rules for the board of adjustment that have that are mandated from the state level not just the local level and we'll get to that towards the end of this presentation when we talk about the update we did to the ordinance regarding membership also we have our laredo city charter and we have our code of ethics, which we're gonna to review today. And then specifically, the one we deal mostly when we're, when we're talking about something that comes to you is the land development code and the subdivision ordinance. Both of these can be found on the planning website. Also, we're updating this. We're in the process of updating with Recode and we're gonna be coming back to you for Recode to review some of the changes with you in a workshop later this year. Now, Something a little higher level, but it's good to review and understand is that there are different types of decisions that cities make. And this is very important in understanding your role as a board of adjustment. The city makes legislative acts. These are acts made by the city council. They require, typically, they require public input. And these have to do, a good example of this is like a, a zone change. You know, the city gets to decide what goes where. Okay, we want residential over here. We want commercial over here. How do we do that? We elect representatives, our council members, and then they decide where something goes in terms of zoning. They can make that decision entirely based on how they feel. And somebody could sue the city and say, hey, you, you zoned this commercial, but I wanted to do residential, and I'll, I'm going to sue because I wanted, I think it should be commercial. Well, those cases have all been thrown out because the, co the courts have acknowledged this is a legislative decision. It's one where the city council gets to decide. They don't have to, there's not rules that say what goes where in terms of zoning. It is a decision they get to make based on their impression, their decision as a body. Now, once they make the rules, the zoning and the ordinance, then the city has to fulfill those rules. They have to administer those rules, and those are ministerial acts. A good example of that is the Planning Commission. For the most part, the decisions the Planning Commission makes is, as, as uh, Mr. Tejas could tell you, what we're doing in, in, that, in that commission is somebody wants to develop something, and they're coming to the Planning Commission to say, okay, look, I followed all the rules, and the Planning Commission's job is to say, yes, you did, and they stamp it, and now they get to build what they want. Build, getting to build something, to develop something, should not be a political decision. It shouldn't go to the city council. The city council gets to say, wait a second, you did follow all the rules, but you know what? I don't really think this is a good location for a car wash. So no, you don't get to do it. That's not how, that's not how it should work. That decision should be made when the zoning is made, but when it comes, when they're actually coming to build it, that decision should just be ministerial. The determination is, did you follow the rules or not? And then there's a third uh, uh, type of decision that cities make, and that's when they act as a judge. Uh, we say quasi-judicial because it's it's not 100%. It's not truly in the sense of a judge, but but that's how you should think of it. You're acting as a judge because what you're what you're doing is determining should there be an exception granted. And, and you're not here to determine what the rules are or if they're good rules or bad rules. Your, your job is to determine, does, there, does it a, an exception to the rules, is it needed here? And so the, the, in almost all cities, the board granted this authority is the Board of Adjustment. So generally think of this, when it comes to the decisions that come to you, 
and you know, let's say it's a setback issue, and you would say, you know what, I don't like setbacks. I think setbacks are dumb. So you know what, I'm I'm going to vote for this exception because I don't I don't think this person should have to even follow setbacks, and I think the city should abolish setbacks because I because I think you should be able to use your property the whole the whole area no matter what. That is a, it's the privy of the council to get to decide if the rules change. Your job is just to decide, does this merit an exception to the rules? Not, do we like the rules? Are the rules good or bad? That's not the body. That's not the authority of this body. Your decision is to say, hey, wait, we should apply the rules fairly to everybody. But in this instance, is there a need for an exception? Does anybody have any comments on this? Can I say something on that one? Sure. Uh, to the to the new members of this uh, board, that in itself is one of the most important things that we have to remember. We cannot let personal feelings uh, come into play on this thing. We have to do, we have to abide by what is the rules and do we need to grant an exception to the rule and for what reason? And, and we've come to find out that there's very few uh, reasons that many times uh, this should be granted. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yes, and you all have done a great job, both us well, working together with staff and the training, and we have, in making this very clear and understanding the law, that the way the state law is and the local law, we've been able to really clean up what the Board of Adjustment was doing. I mean, we were having three, four cases a month because it was just granting exceptions left and right, but we've really nailed it down into how it should be and we're educating the public as well and so you're that's why you're not meeting as often you're you're meeting as often as normal cities board of adjustments meet it's actually it's not usually a monthly meeting it's typically a quarterly meeting in a lot of cities because it's so infrequent to have exceptions which is how the state law and the local law intends it but we'll get to all that so let's continue on Ms. Geta, that's your cue. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that that was that was when I was supposed to jump in. <laughs> that's you. I was like, did did the mics go out? <laughs> okay. Uh, the next section we're going to talk about rules governing the board. Um, officially, the Zoning Board of Adjustment it is a sovereign board. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, in other, with regard to other boards, like the the board of um, the historic board, appeals from the historic board can go to city council. But that's very different with the board of adjustment. Appeals from the board of adjustment go to city to district court. So it goes beyond um, the city. It goes directly to district court. Now, what is the what are the types of appeals that the board is gonna gonna consider? And the two types that are listed are administrative appeals and substantive appeals. So an administrative appeal, what, what is that? An administrative appeal is where the applicant is alleging that the building official or any other city officer has made a mistake, that we're reading the laws incorrectly, that we are in error in some way in how we're uh, interpreting or applying the the rules. So they're saying, hey, you all got it wrong. You're reading it wrong. Um, this is really what it says. You know, the three car or two cars or one car is allowed is um is required per, per residential unit, not two. So that's that's the the difference between an administrative appeal and then we're going to talk about substantive appeal. Now the substantive appeal is where and you'll talk about uh, two things, either where we're talking about reconstruct, go ahead. Can I make a comment on administrative appeal? Sure, go ahead. So you're gonna hear this and you've heard it before where they say, oh, well, the city told me I could do this. So I went ahead and did it. Now in those cases, the burden of proof is on who? The city or the, the applicant? Yeah, it's on the applicant. So, okay, if you're saying we told you, show us where we told you, did we? Because we are very careful when we tell someone they can do something, we don't just, someone calls up, hey, can I do that? And we're like, oh yeah, no, no, no problem, no problem, you know? No, we're, we we want to be very specific because when we're granting authority, it's typically official in terms of here's something, here's a permit that's been issued. And if we do explain something to someone, we like to do it 
in an email form where we're referencing the code so that they can understand it clearly what they can do. So when someone just says, hey, the city said I could do it, they should be proving to you that we did. Where, oh, I've got an email here where Jerry Pinzone, the building official said, yeah, I don't need a permit for that. I can go ahead and start work on this pool. And uh, what you'll find is if with that burden of proof, almost never does that happen. Um, and so sorry to interrupt, but continue on. Jeremy, could, could I also mention that um, our code that we use is the IBC. And I know you mentioned land development code and ordinances and stuff, but and everybody, this is Mr. Pinzone, Jerry Pinzone. This is the building official for the yes. city. It's his responsibility in the code in many places to be the one issuing, overseeing the issuing of permits and making interpretations. And uh, his position is not appointed. And no, he's meant to be not a political good. position, but a qualified uh, position. And um, in a lot of the determinations he makes. So sorry, Jerry, to interrupt. Just wanted to introduce you. Go ahead. Okay. So. I just wanted to mention that um, because it does say here uh, about misinterpretation. So, so we use um, the 11 different books that are provided by the International Code Council. So the books that we use are the residential book, the electrical book, the mechanical book, the plumbing book, the existing building code, book, book, the building code, which is commercial. Uh, the fire code, um, the swimming pool guide, the uh, field gas book. Um, so I think I'm missing two more, but anyway, so there's different books that we follow that uh, talk about the code and we apply it to everything that is built vertically and horizontally. And Thank I you, Jerry. So yes, there is a lot we're referring to, not just the in all the references that we have. And, and Mr. Pinzone is very careful when explaining things to applicants. And and um, so it's rare that someone's gonna be, going to be officially claiming that, but I hear it thrown out there a lot, like, well, the city said I could do it. But again, Bernie is on them. Now, on to substantive appeals, Ms. Guetta. Sure, substantive appeals that can fall into um, two, two categories, the permitting of reconstruction of a damaged non-conforming building, meaning uh, something that's legal non-conforming that has been damaged. There's rules about the expansion or reconstruction of, uh, of non-conforming buildings, and there's limitations on on that expansion and uh so you would the board would hear hear those under the substantive appeal category and then there's the variances the variances to the building setback to height to uh distance the area lot width all the different performance standards associated with um, land development and those uh, the the important thing is that the variances only be granted in peculiar or unusual circumstances that would create a hardship. And we, we're going to talk about what what's a hardship. Um, and I guess uh, you know probably we want to throw that out there. What what is a hardship? What what do we think of as a hardship? So just to review, there are two types of appeals that can be brought before the board of adjustment. One is a administrative appeal where someone's saying, hey, the staff messed up here. So uh, it's not my fault. You should let me do this thing because staff messed up. That's administrative. The second type of appeal is a substantive appeal. They're saying there's something about the rules that's going to create a hardship if I follow them. But what is a hardship? What, In other words, what is a justifiable reason for an exception? to the rules. Any thoughts? Hard to be able to use the property. Yeah, great point that, 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 that they're not gonna be able to use the property very easily, but we'll get into that. Any other thoughts? What is a hardship? What is a... The PDA. Yeah, in designing it, they, yeah, often there's, uh, for those who have access, who have disabilities, if they're following the rules, maybe it makes it too hard. 
we've heard that before to, to build it the, the right way or to build the way by the rules would make it unaccessible to people with disabilities okay continuing well a hardship um and we've we've heard all the things that were mentioned and especially oh it's it's too expensive um, you know what if they come back and just say making the property usable would be just too expensive for me uh, uh that, that's that's exactly what we hear quite a bit but yeah. what we know from the law is that the hardship cannot be personal Hardship is based on the the unique circumstances of the property. So it's it, whether, it, you know, expenses, those sorts of things that are personal to the property owner are not relevant. The I hardship, haven't heard that before. Can you recall some of the examples people have used as personal hardships, as, as asking for an exception to the rules because of a personal hardship? Can you remember any examples from your previous cases? Well, a lot of times they come and they come and the property's already been used. They already put the driveway past the past the lot, the setback. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But you're right. Sometimes they'll 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 go ahead and build something the wrong way, and then we explain, no, you're going to have to tear that down and build the right way. And they say, well, I already spent all my money. I don't have any money. I'm I'm poor. You know, I I, I don't have a money to fix it. Um, you know, we've we've heard that a lot. People bringing up their personal circumstances. We also heard before an example where someone says they they were a veteran, and so they they use that as an opportunity to say, well, maybe. I mean, they didn't say it like this, but they they brought that into the equation, saying, well, you know, I served my country. I'm a veteran. Can't you make an exception here? I remember we had one uh, Kirby one time where it was a hardship, it was an irregular lot, and they were asking for a setback exception to build a handicap ramp. And, so, and that, that, that that was granted based on the fact that it was an irregular sized lot and, and kind of the shape and the only way it could make it work was to get uh, grant them an exception. I have a que question and I hear echoes. Um, what if they didn't get a permit, they constructed years have passed. Oh, Mr. Montes, I'm sorry, I accidentally muted you. Um, if you can unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? What, what, what if years have passed and this is a residential property, can we go back and make them tear it down? There, well, if I understand your question correctly, you're saying somebody maybe built something illegally and now we caught it, and but it was done years ago. Yes. Well, it depends. If the rules when they built it, if it was legal when they built it, but now the rules have changed, we already have rules for that. It's called legal non-conforming or grandfathered. They never follow the rule. So if they never follow the rules, then there is no, how do they say, Mr. Tejas, in legal, you know, where you, you got a, you know, somebody commits a crime, but it was a long time ago, so now we can't pursue it. What's that called? Statute of limitations. Statute of yeah. limitations. There is no, it doesn't work that way in, with building. You know, there is no statute of limitations that, okay, you did something illegal 10 years ago, well, now you're fine. Although we do have a few places in our code that say, a good example is illegally subdivided lots. We grandfathered everybody in as of 1978 when we made some big changes back then. But uh, that's- Didn't we distinguish those lots? Didn't we call some lots legal conforming and some illegal uh, non-conforming or legal non-conforming and then illegal non-conforming that were never done right in the first place and some were done right, but they are now not conforming. That's Didn't true. We Legal, legal non-conforming means when they did it, it was legal, but the rules have changed, so it's no longer conforming with the current rules. But we do, we do have some case, we do have an example in our current code where we grandfathered in, where we made legal conforming um, some illegal lots that were done before 1979. 
So to so, answer your question, Mr. Montez, it, there's a very, very few cases which we already have on the books where we can allow something that was done illegally. But other than that, no, it doesn't matter if it was done 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, if it's illegal, it's illegal. And we don't need those to come to the Board of Adjustment. Um, in fact, they wouldn't. That, that's not a reason to come to the Board of Adjustment because it was a long time ago. But I think uh, also, Kirby, to answer Mr. Monta's question, uh, no, we cannot uh, We cannot make them tear it down. Uh, that That's one thing I think we're still working on, uh, getting the authority to do something like that, right? Am I correct, Kirby? Well, no, we actually can. Um, now, the question of do we, that becomes a different one of, you know, of enforcement and political will and, you know, sometimes those get, the enforcement of it is, is a, a ministerial decision, and you know how that goes sometimes. But we do have the authority to require someone to take down an illegal structure, especially if it's an unsafe structure, and we have done that in the past. But it's it's not easy. It's it's hard. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Okay, so now that we've talked about hardship, hardship cannot be a self-created situation, meaning, uh, and the, here's here's some common examples of, of hardships that are created by the property owner. Uh, and we, and the, you all mentioned some of them, that they build without a permit or they build um, in deviation of the permit that was approved, um, or the landowner just divides illegally, and then now the you know the, he sells the property, and the new property owners are now left with these irregular lots that are difficult to build upon because of this the subdivision that was done illegally. So when we're granting a variance as a board of adjustment, when we're determining whether something deserves an exception, somebody saying they made they made a mistake themselves they created this difficult situation that does not come to the level of an exception that does not come that does not deserve an exception in other words remember this irregular lot that that's a good reason somebody should be given a, a variance because if we applied the rules to some of these irregular lots well then they're left with such small area they can actually build a home so we look at that and we say all right board of adjustment here's an irregular lot. And on often as staff, we'll recommend approval. We'll say, yeah, this is a good one. Here's a regular lot. If we apply the rules to this one, they can't build much. So yeah, they need an exception to the rules so you can vary their setback from 10 feet down to five feet to give them more buildable area. But what if the irregular lot was created because they took a, a normal lot and then they divided up into a weird way? And that's different. That is different because they had a legal lot but they changed it themselves and sold it off and you know or somebody bought one that was weird knowing or even not knowing that's a different situation so that's the point we're trying to make here is you can't create the situation yourself you can't build something illegally over the weekend then we catch it then you come in and by the way there's already a penalty we can address that without the board of adjustment as long as it's legal we can make them pay a fine and then they can get a building permit after the fact it's usually double the cost i understand directly on that, Mr. Gonzalez. But um, but it, let's say they build without a permit illegally, and then when we catch them, we find out, actually, this is not, you won't be able to get a building permit because it was done against the rules. Again, they created that hardship themselves. But there are cases when we do, when, there, when we do need to grant an exception, because if we apply the rules to their property, then there's, there's not, well, what they'll claim is, well, if I follow the rules, there's nothing I can do with my property. Now, the question is, really? Is it really nothing you can do? Well, I can do some things, but I can't do what I want. That gets to the question of reasonable use. You want to take it from there, Ms. Gavin? Sure, sure. Uh, what is a reasonable use? Because that's something that we need to make sure that is preserved, that the uh, property owner has, continues to have reasonable use of the property. So go ahead. Yeah, what do you think, board members? What does it mean, reasonable use? And let me ask this again. So if we're thinking about giving somebody an exception, when we apply the rules to their property, their unique property, they're claiming, well, if you apply the rules to me, 
I can't do anything with my property. And then we ask them, well, are you, you know, you can do this and this. Well, yeah, I can do some things, but I can't do what I want. And so they're claiming they, they've, they're being uh, unfair. It's the rules are unfairly applied to them because they can't do what they want. Well, what, how do we determine how much they get to do with their property? In other words, what is reasonable use of their property that that should be preserved? I'm not sure if I'm asking this the right way. It's like the ADA uh, asks for reasonable accommodation. Uh, so in a property, something that is uh, within financial uh, sustainability. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good parallel. Thanks for finding a good example there, Mr. Montes. That's a great example. When the federal government put in place rules for the, with the American Disabilities Act, they said that certain types of organizations, not all, but most businesses that serve the public, especially big ones, they have to make reasonable accommodations to serve people with disabilities. But that doesn't mean they have to bend over backwards. And I mean, if, if it makes them go out of business to have to serve somebody, well, I won't get into that, all the details of that. But if all they have to do is make some, it's, it's going to cost them some money, but they've got to put in some ramps and put in some elevators. And that's reasonable accommodation, and they need to make those. And we also have this term with the Board of Adjustment. We, we don't, well, I'll have Ms. Geta review what reasonable use is. Yeah, yeah, reasonable use doesn't entail that the property owner is able to do every use or even every use uh, of a certain type. Let's say, you know, they want to build a swimming pool, but there's a there's a util there's an easement in the back, you know. Well, they can still use it. The property is still usable for residential purposes. However, they just aren't able to use it for all the purposes that they want to use. So a property that still has reasonable use, even if the regulations limit the size or design or, or even make it more expensive, that's not that's not either a hardship or unreasonable, even if it's more expensive. In general, uh, regulations that reduce the, pro the potential profitability of otherwise developable commercial or residential property does not constitute a lack of reasonable use. So if somebody says, hey, you know, if I follow the rules, it just it's it just makes it way more expensive for me. Well, you st that's maybe the case. However, it is still the reasonable use of the land is still preserved. So uh, moving on uh, to conduct of the board meetings, how we how we're gonna uh, handle the board meetings. The what you've noticed is that staff now is will make their presentation first, and this is uh, so as to give um, the board as well as the public, you know, orient them on the case, give them the basic facts of the case. Then, then the applicant is allowed to make their case. Um, they'll stand up and give uh, their, you know, particulars uh, on the information on the on their case, and then the board will then um, be free to ask them follow up questions if you know if they choose, um, and that's to either uh, staff or the applicant. But we would hope and we prefer that that we refrain from being argumentative with the applicants either you know, that it's not um, a debate or you know arguing with them we just want to be mindful of evidence that's what we're trying to find is evidence rather than opinion and then uh we we um recommend that you don't indicate uh which way you lean on the case until after the hearing Once the hearing is closed, the applicant should no longer speak. So in many, many times you'll see, you know, when the board starts to discuss it, the applicant wants to get up and, you know, talk a little bit more, but that's not, should not be the case. Once the hearing is closed, the applicant should no longer speak. The board's emotions should cite their findings and reasoning for their decision. And this is to help the, the record so that we have a record, um, you know, if if the the case is reviewed at a later time. 
And of course, we follow Robert's rules of order for motions. And I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar. A motion is a proposal that the entire membership take action or stand on an individual issue. Individual board members may, of course, move or second a motion, debate the motion, and a vote on motions. So just to review that order, and you know, there's if you've ever seen a Robert's Rules of Order, it's like a book like that thick. I mean, it get, gets pretty intense. But for our purposes, just remember, first, you make a motion, and you need someone to second it. If there is no second, the motion dies. So you need someone to make a motion and then someone to second it. Once it's seconded, then the chair can ask, okay, we've got a motion in a second. Now let's have some discussion. So now you debate the motion amongst each other. And then when the chairman sees fit, he'll say, okay, we've had enough discussion. Now it's time to vote on this motion. And then you take a vote. So let me talk a little bit about ethics. You can locate the code of ethics for the city by visiting this link, or you can go just Google Laredo City Code of Ethics, and the first link that comes up, it, it was recently amended in 2019, so that's the most recent one. And it's about, if I recall, it's uh, several pages long, but the, their, the pertinent areas don't take too, time, too much time to review. Just a general rule, what we wanna do is avoid the appearance or risk of impropriety. In other words, we want to make sure that the public knows that you're making decisions out of no interest to you or, or people you're trying to benefit, but you're making decisions because you think it's the right thing to do. Now, sometimes you, you've asked the staff, I've gotten questions before of, hey, Kirby, this, this item coming up, you know, it's my cousin's thing. Should I recuse myself? Well, you can review this for yourself in the ethics guidelines. Basically, we're, we're referring to a member of you or your household, your parent, child, spouse, or other family member within the third degree of affinity or the third degree of consanguinity. So whether they're related to you through marriage or through direct, um, you know, they're directly in your immediate family, that's when you have to consider whether or not there's a conflict of interest. But typically, it's that they have a direct financial interest in it. So, you you know, your neighbor could come in for the board of adjustment. You could say, oh, I don't want, you know, I, I, I need to recuse myself because this is my neighbor and I know him. No, actually, you don't. Um, it's, it's okay that they're your neighbor. Now, you may, may not want to participate because you don't, you don't want to give him the answer that he or she wants. That's a different that is a different topic, but you should not recuse yourself. You should only recuse yourself in the cases where you have, you or a member of your household has a direct financial interest. There is also a very important paragraph in the ethics code, and it states a member of the, and then it lists a bunch of boards and commissions. Basically, these are decision-making boards, and you are listed in this board of adjustment. Shall not represent any person group or entity. I know sometimes board commission members, committee members, I've heard them say things like, well, you know, as a member of district so, uh, number, um, you know, I know the will of my people in my district and as this district, you know, for this district, I'm voting this way. You do not represent your district. You don't represent the interests of your district or the people in your district or the demographics of your district. You don't represent your council member. You were appointed by a council member, but you were you were voted in by the entire council, and you represent the entire city as a board of adjustment member. It would be inappropriate for a member of the city council to call you and to weigh in on the decision uh, that you're going to make. It would be inappropriate for the applicant to call you and to weigh in on the decision. The appropriate response, if that ever occurs, would be to tell them, hey, I appreciate you calling, However, if you have information to share, it'd be better you share this at the public meeting where the public can hear the information that you're sharing and not just myself. Now, I know it's easy for me to tell you this and it's hard for you to do this on an actual phone call. I know that, okay? Well, you might be scratching your head right now saying, Kirby, come on, you don't get it. All right, this is Laredo. Things are a little different here. <laughs> well, it, we gotta change it. We gotta change it because the public wants to know that these decisions aren't made in a back room, that they're, they are made at the public meeting where they can have comments. So 
you should show up at a meeting not sure which way you're going to vote. That would be the way. To, if you show up at a meeting already knowing which way you're going to vote, then you're probably doing it wrong. Because you need to hear all the facts, you need to hear all the information, and then make a determination. And you're not making that determination for any other reason than you think it's the right thing to do. And as staff will remind you of this, uh, um, we'll, we'll always remind you of this, but it's ultimately your responsibility to do that. Now, moving on to the final part of this training, I wanted to update you on the ordinance that affects membership, because for a long time, my understanding, we were doing it the right way, and then for the last maybe decade plus, we were doing it the wrong way. And the rules are not only from our local ordinance, but also from state law. So this is what it used to read. A zoning board of adjustment is created consisting of five members and four alternates. So there were only ever supposed to be five voting members. Remaining the council should each nominate one, one member. By lottery, the first five nominees should be selected as regular members. So basically, there, were, there was a lottery in place. Remember, we've reviewed all this, and that was confusing. Like, how do we do the lottery and who get, you know, it was it, it was very confusing. And then it was two-year terms and alternates, and, and you guys all gave us some input on, well, we would like it just to be a nine-member board. We agreed. However... It is state law that requires a greater than simple majority. State law requires that the threshold when granting exceptions be a three-fourths or higher majority. And so the way that it changed, this is what we brought to the council, and the council decided to make this change. We took out all that confusing bit in the middle. We took out the need for five members and four alternates. And what we're left with is this. A zoning board of adjustment is created consisting of nine members. So now each of you is, all of you are voting members. You don't have to worry about being an alternate. Mayor and council shall appoint one member each. Here, so you're appointed until someone reappoints. So we just took out all that confusing language because you're going to stay there until somebody else appoints you. Hearings before the zoning board of adjustment shall be public. The board of adjustment shall elect the chairman and vice chairman person. The board shall act by a motion in which not less than a three-fourths majority rounding up of concurring votes are required to reverse an administrative decision or grant a variance. So that was, if you think that was a change, that wasn't. Actually, it already was a, it, there were only five members supposed to be voting and you had to have four out of five concur. With, if you read the last line down here, it says the board shall act by a motion in which not less than four concurring votes are required. So it was four out of five previously. And we're just carrying that forward. It's a three-fourths majority. And the reason we said it that way is because we're, we're having all nine of you show up, but you only need five to make a quorum. In other words, if nine of you show up, you need seven out of nine to vote for something. If eight of you show up, you need six. If seven of you show up, you need six. If six of you show up, you need five. If five show up, which is the minimum for a quorum, then four of you need to vote and you need to concur to make a decision. Is that clear? Does anybody have any questions on that? It's math, but you know, sometimes math gets the best of us. So simple math. No questions? Okay, well, any questions about anything we reviewed today in this training? Any questions or comments? No, I think we've heard that before. Good. Good. <laughs> any other any comments on anything today about uh, the training, anything with the ethics or the way we run the meeting or about granting variance administrative or substantive appeals? Any comments or questions? No, I'm, we're, I'm glad we were able to get that change made on the uh, the last comment you made regarding the number of people and the alternates. That was very confusing. Well, we did it with your help. We um, we we kept the nine as you requested, so that all nine of you could be there instead of making it come bringing it down to five. So, all right. Do we do we have uh, any cases today? No, sir. We don't. Um, your comments, then. Just want to thank each of you for your service. What you do here on the board, the service you give is free. You don't get paid for any of your time in the meeting or outside the meeting to prepare for it. I want to acknowledge that always at every meeting to the public so they understand that you're volunteers, you're residents who volunteer your time, and we appreciate it very much as staff. And just to reiterate in case some of you all missed it, 
we will go back into public meetings at some point and I'll work with the chairperson for the termination of that as well as we'll wait for council to give us direction. It may be soon. Things are looking really good, but I can't say for sure. But we will let yep. you we will alert you as soon and give you plenty of time to prepare. We're and missing those great lunches. Um Yeah, you owe us. <laughs> yeah, that's um, really good. Kirby or Vanessa, if you would share the email addresses of everybody to everybody. So that way, in case any of the new members may have questions or something regarding uh, anything, they can uh, they can communicate with us. That I have to be a little careful with. I will, I'll, I'll share y'all's um, communication with each other, but you need to understand that that from the Texas Open Meetings Act, there's something called a walking quorum. So if you meet as a quorum, that has to be noticed to the public, to so the public. I'm if, talking about individuals. If one of you were to call four other people, you just broke the law. That's a walking quorum. But if one person were to call one person. That's okay. That's that's okay. That's, so I'm just reminding yeah. you of the rules in case those that don't know it. You would not want to call five or, you know, multiple committee members before a decision to see, hey, how are you feeling about this and sharing your thoughts. That, that is not just not good, it's also illegal, and there are severe consequences to that. So, um, fortunately, that's the burden of serving in a position you serve in. There, there, are, there are some responsibilities there. So we'll share that contact info, but be very careful. We always, when we send out emails to you, we use the BCC option so that you don't see, you're not able to reply back to all, and, and then that even, it even applies to, to, it even applies to electronic communication, so. Emailing the whole quorum is is breaking the law as well for you, not for staff. All right. Is there anything else? Nothing else. We need a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn and stay safe. A second. Okay. I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Turby, you have anything else? No, sir. Thank you all very much. We'll see you soon.